Welcome everyone to our special needs planning webinar series from redtreehouse.org. I think we'll have a few people continuing to join us, but in light of the time, I wanna make sure we have adequate time for everyone to, um, for our presenters to be able to go over the material. So we'll go ahead and get started. Just a little bit of housekeeping, uh, you will see as an attendee, a screen that has web, um, the web information, our screens on the left, and a control panel. If it happens to close on you, this little arrow here, um, you can open it back up and close it. You can also go to the file and options and keep it as open instead of auto hide. So you would uncheck the auto hide. Everyone's in mute mode as an attendee to start with. That makes it possible for us to hear the presenters the best. Um, however, you will be able to ask questions and you can submit those in the text box in the uh, question field. If you have any trouble with audio or anything else, you can submit a, um, a question through that as well. And our folks behind the scenes will help out with that. At, if we have enough time at the end and there and we want to have some verbal questions, you can raise your hand and we will unmute you and be able to uh, have you ask your question. All right, today's webinar in our series is on financial strategies for families with special needs. And we have Katie Bryan and Bruce Matana from Skylight Financial Group helping us. And this webinar is a Red Tree House webinar, and Red Tree House is a program of the Ronald McDonald House of Cleveland. Even though Red Tree House covers all of the state of Ohio, um, our organization it exists to help families whose child is getting some kind of medical or health care treatment in our area, and we have 55 room house, and we also have family rooms in each of four hospitals in the area to help families have um, a bit brief respite and an ability to stay close to their child while they're receiving treatment. And Red Tree House helps with the connecting families and helping them find resources after their stay as well as during and before their stay. This webinar is made possible in part by a grant from the Ohio State Bar Foundation. And as with any kind of legal information, we have to disclaim that the views expressed herein do not necessarily represent those of the Ohio State Bar Foundation. Our featured speakers today are Katie Bryan, as I mentioned, and Bryce Matana. And I met Katie at a couple of other special needs uh, networking meetings and was very impressed with her knowledge. Um, she is a PhD as well as a financial planner, a PhD in behavioral neuroscience and did some, some work prior to becoming a financial planner and with the Cleveland Clinic, Case Western, and the Cleveland VA, and uh, knows a lot about special needs families. She has been very active in the community as a financial planner, as well as I mentioned, she's on several boards, including Medina Creative Housing, the Renee Jones Empowerment Center, and A Place for Us, and is currently on the executive board for Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging and Connecting for Kids. Her um, other special uh, area of specialty is LGBT financial planning. And Bryce is joining us and he joined Skylight Financial Group in January of 2017. And his areas of focus are also working with special needs families, families, small business owners and people in the medical field. We also have uh, Helen Rapp and if you were on our other webinar, you met Helen there. And Helen has been a volunteer and a legal intern with us at Ronald McDonald House. She's a new attorney and also a parent of two um, adult children who have had special needs of one kind or another. And she works full time in her career as an uh, engineer, engineering manager, um, but she has been indispensable to us in helping bring the perspective of the family as well as the law and helping to update and write guides for Red Tree House, etc. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Helen, who you can see on her webcam. 
Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome. Um, as Janine mentioned, I am the mother of two adult children who have special needs, and I'm also a new attorney. And I'm really, really excited to be participating um, in this session today. And I'm thrilled that Katie and Bryce are going to lead this session because I know that the type of information that they're about to share with you um, is really important um, to families like mine. Um, before we get started, um, I would like to point out that this is, as Janine mentioned, actually the second webinar in our special needs planning series. And some of you may have been with us back in April when we had uh, Blaine Brockman from Hickman and Louder um, talk to us about a number of legal issues per pertaining to special needs planning. If you did not participate in that session, I would encourage you after today to look for it on the Red Treehouse website. Um, it will supplement or complement a lot of the material that Katie and Bryce are going to be presenting today. Um, you can see on the screen right now some learning objectives that we have put together. These are the takeaways that we hope that you leave today with, um, things for you to be thinking about as you listen to Katie and Bryce go through the session. And with that, I'll turn it over to Katie. Thank you. Well, we want to thank you very much for having Bryce and myself here today. Um, it has been great to partner on this with Ronald McDonald House and the Red Tree House. Um, so we thank you guys very much. Uh, today, I will let Bryce start off, and we're going to go through what special needs planning is, how we work with clients, um, and what planning really means, uh, and go from there. But hopefully, if you have questions, please do feel free to type, um, and we'll try to get to any questions you might have and address them. Doesn't seem like I have control. Uh, Janine, I think we need control. Push the button. It's not letting us control it, Janine. Jean. I, I did give it to you. I'm sorry. I'll go ahead and advance the slide. Sorry. Perfect. So like Katie said, um, thank you for everyone for joining us. Um, like Janine said, my name is Bryce Smetana, and I am a financial planner here at Skylight financial group and a part of the special needs planning team. And my partner, Katie, she is also a financial planner here and a member of the special needs planning team here at Skylight. And as Katie mentioned, uh, today we will break down how a special needs planner can serve as the manager or coordinator uh, in the planning process and help you prepare for the financial well-being of your loved ones. And with what we found, from our clients is that they are so inundated with all the moving parts of daily living and going from one activity to another that when they really stop to try to plan and think about some of these things that it can be a little bit overwhelming and lead to them being unsure uh, where to start or who to really have that type of conversation with when it comes to planning for their future. And when it comes to when not being sure when the best time to start is unfortunately you know years go by and we put it off again and again and you know the next thing we know we look up and we're in the same position as we were next slide So over the years, we found uh, many fam families often have the same questions and concerns like, what will my child do after 22? Will they work? Will they go to school? Uh, will they live at home? Uh, will I ever personally be able to retire? How do I choose a guardian or a trustee? How do I let, write a letter of intent? Who will care for my child if I can't? Uh, a big one is, what is a special needs trust and do I need one? What is the right amount of life insurance and, or, the, or the right type to have? Uh, another popular question is, can my child lose their government benefits? Do I have a life plan for my child? And what would happen to my son or daughter if I were disabled? 
So when we look at life care planning, the planning really breaks down into four different stages. Um, the first stage being early intervention or the first three years. And those first three years can definitely be the hardest and an absolute whirlwind uh, for a lot of families from when they first receive the diagnosis and trying to do everything they can to learn about the diagnosis and truly understand it and find out what treatments and medications are out there and what other therapies might be needed. Um, and then this usually leads, or during this time, they start to question if something were to happen to them, uh, what would happen to their child? And this usually leads to them seeking out you know, more information on life care planning. And then after the dust settles and hopefully the family can take you know, a deep breath and start to really think about some other things after those first few years, uh, families transition to the next stage or the education stage and really wanna know what else is out there from a community uh, resource and support standpoint, as well as start really thinking and planning about how to best set up their child for the future. After education, uh, families think about what else is out there from an employment and a housing aspect how to go about choosing a guardian, uh, what are the different types of government benefits, and how do I maintain our eligibility for those, and really start to think, you know, what is next and what do we want for our child. And then at age 22 and beyond, uh, it is very important to have a resource for not only the parents or the guardian, but also the child. And at this stage, it really ties together and starts to get the family thinking about what other key family members do we have in place? What other support teams or support systems are out there? And probably one of the most or more important question is, you know, what quality of life do we want for our child? Because, you know, if we're longer here, no longer here, um, our child is hopefully going to have a long and happy life after us. Okay, so we would like to find out a bit from our audience where you're at. So we're going to have a little survey. So if you could, as a participant, please indicate in which life care planning stages are you or your family member or the clients that you work with if you're a professional. You can choose more than one. We'll just give a moment or so. We have about two thirds of folks who have voted. Okay, we've got 100% voting. Very good. Okay, and I'll share that now. Oh, it's pretty even. <laughs> All across the board. So, okay. Excellent. All right. So we'll go back now to the next part on focus teams. Perfect. Uh, so focus teams, um, or as we see it, each family should have or has a unique set of resources in their lives when it comes to the social, medical, or financial segments. And the key to really having it be successful and a successful team is bringing those teams together and having it be more of a fully integrated and collaborative approach uh, to your future planning, which leads to the next slide of the financial team. And as most families already have a team of doctors or therapists or maybe even aides in place that they can go to on a daily basis or are a main part um, of the daily life of their child, it is also important to not only think about, but to also have some key members within your own financial planning team, such as tax preparers, uh, debt and mortgage specialists, estate planning attorneys, liability or property and casualty insurance specialists. And these professionals are all, should be all, you know, familiar with the unique challenges a family with a special needs child or adult may have. And a lot of these professionals 
uh, help put dollars back into the family's pockets and help educate our families along the way. And for example, maybe a lot of the time a family's tax professional may not exactly know that the family has a child with special needs or the family does their own uh, tax preparation and may, might be unaware of all the potential of all the potential deductions that are out there from a medical and just a daily living um, perspective that are that might be being left on the table. So the big question for today is, you know, what is what is really special needs planning and Special needs planning looks at many different areas and it's the integration of the parent's personal plan and the costs that are associated or what they want for their child. And then what is the true cost associated with caring for their child over the lifetime and how to really integrate both those two plans. And if the parent's plan is off from a retirement or a protection standpoint, then the child's plan is already broken. Um, and Katie will now break down some of the or the eight key areas that are shown here within special needs planning and some specifics within each one. Okay. I think though, before we do that, we'll do a little poll that says what topic is of primary interest to you so that we can kind of see what we should spend the most time on. And there are a few options there and again i believe you can now this one you only get to pick one We've got about 50 percent voting Got 83% voted. We'll just give another couple seconds there. Sometimes it's hard to know, too. All right, we'll close that poll and I'll share that. So it looks like assistance programs is a big one, but also I think that that is, that is involved with the estate planning and the adequate protection and maintaining those assets. So, all right, great. Thank you for participating. We'll head back to the presentation. Excellent. Well, thank you guys for sharing that. And I will try to spend some extra time then on assistance programs since I think 40% of us really want to review some of those things. Um, so we'll make sure that we talk about that. Um, when we think of special needs planning, we really think of eight key areas of planning. And some of them are important for everybody, and some of them are especially important for our families who have children or adults with special needs. So I'm going to go through briefly each one of those eight key areas and talk a little bit about how um, they are influenced and how they influence the life care plan for their children. So the first one is called financial position. And really, this is just having a good understanding of what income is coming into the household and what the expenses are leaving the household. Now, this is important for any family, but especially important for families with special needs, typically because they have some out-of-pocket costs, whether that be medications, therapies, summer camps, um, you know, doctor's visits, whatever that might look like, sometimes those expenses can cause us to go into more debt or not have the right resources to be able to pay off for those different expenses. So financial position and understanding really where our dollars are going is very important to anybody's plan, but will be essential for a special needs plan. Um, the next one would be adequate protection. So adequate protection strategies are very important and helps answer that specific question of if something were to happen to me and I were unable to earn my income due to a disability or if one of the family members passes away who brings in income to the household, what would happen to my child who has a special need? So that could be um, I become disabled and all of a sudden I'm not bringing in income to the household if I'm living off of 60 to $80,000 for expenses per year, 
and all of a sudden I'm not earning enough money to keep up with just my living expenses, that's going to have a huge impact on my child and their ability to have funds and availability to them as well. So understanding what kind of life insurance um, I have through group policies at work, what kind of life insurance I have, maybe individual policies that I have outside of the work, as well as short-term disability and long-term disability are essential to at least having a good understanding of what would happen if something were to happen to me in any of those circumstances. As our parents age who have children with special needs or adults with special needs at that time, the other part of that would be to really understand long-term care and understanding that if I've saved up a significant amount of asset that I wanted to essentially have go to my child, if something happens and I end up using having to go into a long-term care facility, I may have to actually deplete those assets over my lifetime that were intended for my child or my adult with special needs. So we wanna make sure that we at least understand what the what ifs are and what we can do um, either individually or through our group insurances to best protect our family from any of those instances. Um, for the next strategies, we call these wealth strategies, but really this is just other buckets. So families who have children and adults with special needs typically still want to save money for their child for education, um, college it could be, it could be special schools that they want to go to, um, programs or camps that they want. So a lot of times it's trying to understand and figure out from a financial aspect of how much they actually need to be saving for some of those future buckets. So wealth strategies really doesn't have a lot to do with investments, but has a lot to do with what are those other things that you want to make sure are there for your children year over year or in the future? And how do you best save for those, especially if you're feeling like you don't have enough dollars on a day-to-day -day basis just to do the necessary things for yourself? So it's starting to try to figure out how can we, from understanding our financial position, begin to put extra dollars in our pocket to save for some of these future expenses. And we wanna make sure that there's still support care and maintenance there for them too, and figuring out how we're going to fund that life care plan for our children. So the next one is the life care planning. And people always say, well, what is the difference between special needs planning and really just traditional retirement planning? And the big difference is, if you think about it, if you have a child that you know will need um, care and therapies or will need assistance throughout their entire lifetime, they already have a long-term care need. So you will hopefully live a long and happy life and your child will also hopefully live a long and happy life. So if you pass at 85 or 90 years old, your child still has probably another 20, 30, or 40 years of life that they want to have and still be happy and fruitful and have the things that they want. So for life care planning, it's really a component of a variety of different things. What is the vision that you really want for your child? And that is different for every family. So some families really want to make sure that they have independent living. Other families want to make sure that their child is able to stay in the home as long as they can and make sure that that is um, accessible for them. So figuring out what you would want from a living aspect is becoming a very big um, topic of conversation because we have a lot of children who are diagnosed with autism over the past 10, 15 years who are now really starting to transition out of the school system, either at the ages of 18 or 22, who really need care either in home or in independent living facilities. So it's trying to understand that transition and what that would look like. Other things are, if you were not here, a lot of clients ask us, well, you know, what would happen if I'm not here? And I want to make sure that they maintain some of the things that they like to do, like we have families that really like to go to baseball games. So we want to make sure that their needs from not just therapies and, and medical are there, but also their needs from a social aspect and doing the things that they want to do. So creating that and starting to have conversations. 
Um, we understand that you probably are, especially if you have younger children, aren't even thinking that far out. So sometimes it's just saying, what do you want in a couple years for them? What would you want to see for them in five or 10 years? Um, but making the plan very flexible because their needs are gonna change, your needs are gonna change, and new opportunities will probably start presenting themselves as well. A letter of intent is really all of that stuff that is in your head that you know is the manual that we never receive when we first have our children. So when you, I first had my babies, nobody came with a manual on exactly what to do with my child um, when they were having tantrums or things like that. So what a letter of intent does is for all of our families on a day in and day out basis, they know what the life of their child is looking like. They know the foods they like to eat. They know the allergies that they have. They know, you know what kind of water temperature that their bath has to be at. They know what time they need to go to mass or if they have to go to a particular dental hygienist because that's the only one that can actually clean their teeth. So all of that is typically in our heads but not written down. So a letter of intent really allows you to take all of that information you know about your child and really write it down so that if, God forbid, something were to happen, you would be able then to present that either to somebody that you're asking to be guardian um, later on or be guardian of your child if something were to happen to you, or it's just that manual to allow the next person in line to be able to easily see and transition into that role of, of what it takes to really care for your child day in and day out, making sure that they get the best care possible. So letters of intent comes in all different forms. It's not a legal document, so it does not need to be drawn up by an attorney. Um, we at Skylight have a 250 question questionnaire that gets your mind thinking about some of the things that can be included in a letter of intent. Um, but you can also go online and, and Google letter of intent and you'll have some templates there too. But a letter of intent is a really good way to figure out if you don't know who guardians would be of your children if something were to happen to you, the letter of intent would allow you to present um, that document to a couple people that you think might be good guardians and say, hey, this is really the day in and day out of my child. You know, do you think that if I push you down as guardian that this is something that you are okay with? All right, so letter of intent has a few different purposes. Um, but the life care plan also involves all the organizations and all the resources that you have built in those first life, and when, we, when Bryce went through the lifespan, um, you know, we know that you're adding new organizations, you're adding new parent groups, you're adding new resources, you're researching always what's the next thing that you're researching, housing, schools, whatever it might be. So we want to make sure that in your life care plan, we know what's important for you and your family. Okay. Um, the other part of planning, and this goes into the estate plan as well, but for the life care plan, you also want to start to have conversations with other members of your family. And we'll talk about the importance of why this is so important later when we talk about assistance programs. But you want to share the life care plan and what you really want for your child with your family if you feel like they would be an important part of their life if you are no longer here as well. Um, the next piece is tax reduction strategies. So a lot of people don't actually think about tax reduction strategies when they're thinking about special needs planning. Um, but tax reduction strategies is really figuring out how can we save more money and put more dollars into our own pockets by taking the right deductions. For families with special needs, you have to hit over 10% of your adjusted gross income in order to actually start deducting from a federal standpoint um, any medical expenses you have. Now, that being said, a lot of times families actually aren't um, calculating all of the deductions that they could have. So a couple examples might be if you have a child who has allergies and maybe has a, has a case in allergy and they can't have a regular um, yo play yogurt, or they can't just have regular yogurt. So you have to buy a specific type of yogurt. If a yo play yogurt, a regular yogurt is two dollars, 
and the specialty brand is $3, you can actually deduct the difference, so the dollar difference on your taxes, right? So if you're buying a lot of foods that have that are for allergies or for special needs, then that can be calculated as well. Therapies that you're paying for out of pocket, um, therapeutic dogs, iPads that are used for therapy, um, a lot of those electronic devices or any kind of, um, sorry, any kind of furniture or house remodels that you would have to do would all be in there for your tax reduction strategies. So if you have a lot of things that you need to do for your home for remodeling for making it more accessible, try to do those all in one year so that you can try to push yourself above that 10% AGI. Or even if you're going on trips to Disney to go to an autism conference, part of that might be able to be written off as well. So there's a variety of different strategies to reduce your taxes uh, just by bunching them all within one year or really looking to see if you have a lot of, of deductible um, expenses to make sure that you're taking in those into account. Okay, the next one's retirement planning. And like Bryce said, we take retirement planning for the family very seriously because most families come in and say, we don't think we're gonna be able to retire because we have so much other stuff going on and so many other things to pay for. Because not only do we have our child with special needs that we wanna make sure is well taken care of, but we also have our other child who is gonna go to college and we're still funding that as well. And we might also have parents that we're taking care of either financially, emotionally, and physically, and trying to put all those together is really hard. So we don't think we're ever gonna be able to retire, or we don't think about it, and we're thinking about ourselves last. From where we sit, though, retirement planning is essential. So if your retirement plan is already off, meaning you're not gonna be able to retire when you want, or you're gonna have to live, work longer, um, that can have a huge impact on the life care plan for your child because you're gonna be depleting dollars that you would need for your child that you could leave to your child for your own retirement plan if we have not set it up correctly. So we wanna make sure that we understand what kind of investments we're in, what we're saving for, what your retirement picture will look like and how that will integrate with the life care plan for your child as well. Estate planning is a huge question and the question that most families come to us with. So estate planning, for those of you who might not know, really include your general documents of what you would want to happen to your things after you pass. So that would be your wills, your healthcare powers of attorney, maybe a financial power of attorney, and living wills. Those are the four most common documents. And what that allows you to do is to just say from uh, what you would, your wishes would be for your family. Now, when we have a child or an adult with special needs, what happens is, is our state plan um, really has a huge impact on our assistance programs. So if our child turns 18, before our child turns 18, whether we are eligible for Medicaid or Social Security income is really quite dependent on the parent's income. So if I make too much money as a parent before my child is 18, they will not qualify for Medicaid or for Social Security income in most cases. As soon as the child turns 18, though, they are considered a legal adult. And from that aspect, if they have funds in their name, then the state and federal will look at them to say how much money do you have in, that you have in your own name or could you have in your own name. And that will show or depend on how much they get in Social Security income or Medicaid. So the rules are, and this kind of goes into the next part, part of assistance programs, but assistance programs and estate planning go hand in hand when we talk about these things, is that in the assistance programs, when my child is 18, if they have more than $2,000 in their name, and that can include things as a savings account that they own, a 529 college plan that they would be beneficiary of, um, it can include whole life insurance policies that are in their name that they could be a beneficiary of, uh, any kind of trust accounts 
um, that are in their names, not a trust name, but in their names. So if, if they have any assets that are above $2,000, they will need to spend those assets down first before they can qualify to get Social Security income or SSI. It's important to note that SSI is different than Social Security Disability Income, which is SSDI. So SSI says, by definition, that your child has had a diagnosis prior to the age of 26, um, and that will help qualify them for SSI. SSDI is typically there when you have paid into the Social Security system by working and then have become disabled along the way, either from a physical, a mental, or um, an emotional disability. Okay, so those are very different programs. From SSI, again, you cannot have more than $2,000 in the child's name when they turn 18. So if we look at a scenario where a child's 18, or let's, I'm sorry, let's say their child is 25 years old, they have been receiving Social Security income since they were 18, mom and dad pass away, and life insurance and investments all had a beneficiary designation to that child, that child will get kicked out of the SSI program, have to spend down those assets before they can get back in line for that program, okay? So what a lot of clients ask us are, what are special needs trusts, and what is this new ABLE Act account that is out there? And why is it so important and essential when we talk about the assistance programs? Well, in that same scenario I had where the child is 25 years old, if the parents were to pass and they had set up a special needs trust, the assets would first flow into the trust and that child would still, or that adult, would still be able to get their Social Security income benefits because the special needs trust acts as a shelter for collecting those assets, okay? If you have questions on those, please type in there or, or let the uh, Janine know. But I would say that's probably the most common question. And there's a variety of different kinds of special needs trusts. The most common ones um, are the first party special needs trust and the third party special needs trust. The first party special needs trust is a trust in the individual's own name. When they receive any kind of benefits, if they were paid by Medicaid, it is called a Medicaid payback, so they will have to pay back funds from that trust upon their passing, if there's anything left. In a third-party trust, the parents would be the owners of the trust, and the special needs trust would be the beneficiary, and that adult would be the beneficiary. So in that case, they would not necessarily have any of those funds have to go back to Medicaid after that child passed away, okay? So again, the special needs trust is just a shelter to be able to collect assets upon passing or collect assets throughout the lifetime of the child that would not kick them out of Social Security income benefits or Medicaid benefits, okay? In the estate plan, when the child turns 18 or even 22, this might be a time where you sit down with your loved one and figure out if you want to be a guardian for that person. So you can be guardian of the person or you can be guardian of the estate or finance piece or you can be guardian of both. And it's important to make that decision um, with caution because it is difficult to get those revoked later on because you're essentially saying to the court system, I am guardian over my child because I do not believe that they can make their own health care decisions um, or I do not believe that they can make their own financial decisions. We have plenty of families, though, who have children who maybe cannot do finances but are working and doing okay, but uh, and could make their own healthcare decisions. So in that case, you may just be the guardian of the estate and the financial piece. Those are very important things to take care of and, and take into consideration too, because a lot of times, unfortunately, we see adults who have special needs in work environments that there are people there that are trying to take advantage of them because they know they're getting a social security income or they're getting some kind of income benefit from the government. So they befriend them throughout the time, 
And so if they have their own ability to make choices with their money, sometimes they aren't making the best choices because they really like the person that's befriended them. And so they're helping them buy things that you wouldn't really want them to necessarily have the funds to do. And so having guardianship and having guardianship over the estate would allow you to have a little bit more say in their ability to do things like that. The other thing to think about in your estate planning is because a lot of our families really do have um, organizations or nonprofits or therapies that they are working with, um, it might be an opportunity for some families to do some planned giving to those nonprofits through their estate planning to say, hey, if there's any funds left over after my child passes, we would want it to go to a specific organization. And you can do that through your estate plan. You don't need to do all of that right away, and not everybody needs a special needs trust either. So it's one of those things that you would want to consult your attorney or a special needs um, attorney who writes and drafts special needs trusts frequently to do this. Many attorneys say that they do, but you want to ask them always, how many have you done this year? Because what we find is that some attorneys will just say it so that they can get the business, but they really don't know the ins and outs of what the special needs trust does and how it should actually be written. So always go and either use friends and family that have used other special needs attorneys. Um, and I know we had Hickman Louder on the first panel, so that's a great resource for families too. The next piece is assistance programs, which I talked a little bit about, but there is social security income, social security disability income, Medicaid, waiver programs. So if you are not already registered with your county DD, you want to do that as soon as possible so that you can be eligible or your child can become eligible for waiver programs. And I know that they have just started to change this because uh, it used to be you would get on the list and kind of wherever you fell on that list, maybe you know, you're number 400 or your child's number 400 on that list, um, that it was very difficult to continue to move up that list. And as you get, as the child gets older, they tend to move up in, in their eligibility to get waiver programs to and, and these waivers that are out there for each county. Um, but I know that they're changing those so that there are now provisions where there's more, if there's more emergency need, they're gonna move up that list of people faster than they would have previously. But the waiver programs allow you to get extra dollars for therapies, programs, um, schools, that type of thing. And there's different types of waivers. Every county, Ohio is still a county system. So funds come in and every county gets a certain pool of funds to divvy out to their, their list of um, people on the DD list there. So if you are not already registered, register um, if you can. You don't have to accept a waiver. You don't have to accept SSI if you don't want to or SSDI. But if you ever did need it, you would at least be on that program early. All right, I think next slide. So like Bryce said, you know, when we look at planning and we talk about your financial team, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go out and get all those people because you probably have a lot of those people already on board. So you might have your home and auto insurance agent. Um, and the home and auto insurance agent is really important because if you have a lot of liability from having other children with special needs on your property or if your child has autism and is stemming and accidentally hits somebody and breaks their arm, you want to make sure that you have the right liability coverage in place. Because accidents do happen and they're not intentional, but there are people out there that would want to take advantage of that opportunity. So you want to make sure that your property and casualty in agent is, is on board with you. From your person-centered planning though, when we look at the special needs individual, we would say that the best way to build their team is to have the family members involved from grandparents to aunts and uncles to cousins or anyone that really loves that child to be involved in understanding the life care plan for that child. So for instance, if you put your documents in place and you do your estate plan and you have a special needs trust and you don't tell grandma and grandpa and grandpa and grandma leave all of their assets to that child, but they don't leave it to the special needs trust, either one of two things will happen. 
either they will get kicked out of social security and have to spend down grandma and grandpa's money, or they're gonna have to do a lot of extra paperwork and go to court to have it petitioned to go into the special needs trust. So you wanna make sure that family members, if they are going to leave anything, um, or if there's inheritances, or even you know just giving money to the child, that they do it in the right way. Um, so you wanna have that conversation with them. You wanna tell your accountant if you have one, or your tax preparer even, even H&R Block, whoever it might be, that you have a child with special needs. So that, yeah, and I would be even more so to say, you should ask them if they know what deductions are available for special needs. If they don't know, um, then you may want to have them research it or research it yourself and figure out how to best take care of that. But there are a lot of tax preparers and CPAs who do understand special needs tax law and deduction, I'm sorry. Um, you wanna have a good attorney on your team because the attorney is gonna be the one that draws up all the documents from your own wills as well as a special needs trust if you need a trust. Your social and caseworkers are always going to be the ones that are going to be hopefully, not always, but hopefully fighting for you um, and for your child when they are trying to get Medicaid, when they are trying to get waivers, when they are trying to stay on Social Security income. One thing I didn't mention, with Social Security income, once that child turns 18 and they're receiving income, you do wanna be sure that you are logging where those dollars are going. So if you're getting a full $730 per month for that child, you want them, even if they're living at home, to pay you rent and then putting that money in a ledger to say that, that they paid you rent because the they can do audits to say, where's the money going? And if you have no way to show them where the money's went, they can decrease the SSI benefit that you might have. Um, medical professionals are always part of that team as well. So we wanna make sure that as a cohort, your financial professional, as well as all the other professionals in your child's life, don't necessarily have to all talk to each other, but that there's somebody that's quarterbacking all of those things and having a good understanding about that. And that's typically either your attorney or um, a financial planner with the special needs part. Okay, next slide, please. I think we have a poll. Yeah, sorry. It looked like you had another slide in there that didn't. So we're going to see, we talked about letter of intents and I'll described it a little bit. And we'd like to find out how many of you have actually done a letter of intent or something like that or not. And if you're, or if you're still unclear, about what our letter of intent is, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Got about 78% have voted. Okay, I'm going to close that. Looks like most people do not have a letter of intent. That's actually pretty common. Most people have not typically heard of what a letter of intent is um, or have had time to sit down and actually do one. Um, but I would say uh, it is an important document to at least think about and know about. And as you are starting to look for guardians or for people to help you in, in the life care plan of your child or adult, that you do get a letter of intent, even if it's a short one, down on paper somewhere. All right, I'm gonna finish up real quick. I won't go slide by slide, Janine, just for, um, just for time's sake, but can you go to the next slide? We'll just briefly talk about the ABLE Act. So the ABLE Act is a new act called the Achieving a Better Life Experience Act of 2014. Um, and this was uh, an act that came down from the federal government, but then left it up to each state to determine if they wanted to adopt it. And lucky for us in Ohio, they did adopt it. 
And so what the ABLE Act allows families to do is to open an account in their child's name where dollars can be saved or invested, because there's like four different investment choices with Vanguard, um, can be saved or invested for that child on that child's behalf. And the child can use those funds for whatever they like, and it does not kick them out of their eligibility for Medicaid or Social Security income. So even if they have $2,000 or more in that account, they will not be um, kicked out of Social Security income because it's in this ABLE account. Um, the great thing about it is, is that it's tax deferred. So any funds that grow in it uh, are tax deferred. And when you use those funds for any kind of special need, and they've made those provisions pretty open from just you know, care to social to therapy to medical to financial. So they've made it very broad and they did that on purpose. Um, then you will not lose your benefits and you can use that money for the care that you would want them to have. All right, and it's tax free when it comes out. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Janine, thank you. Um, so you are eligible, your child's eligible uh, to continue their social security or SSDI benefit if they're getting that. Um, and anybody can contribute. So you can contribute, family members can contribute. So if grandma and grandpa want to give them a couple thousand dollars or a couple hundred dollars or $10, whatever it might be, they can do that into this account. And then it will allow that child to not get kicked out of benefits. Okay, so for 2018, the max amount that they can receive, though, is $15,000. There are some provisions on the account, though. Um, so you can see here on this slide that there are uh, qualified disability expenses, which we talked about, education, housing, transportation, prevention and wellness, financial management, legal fees, expenses for oversight and monitoring, funeral and burial expenses, technology, health, all those things are included in what you can use these monies for. Next slide. Okay. Um, different treatments are not really considered eligible for means-tested federal benefits programs. Um, so you can put up to $100,000 into this account without getting kicked out of Social Security income. However, if the account ever did reach $100,000, then the, the adult would be, or child would be suspended from SSI benefits until their resources are less than 100,000. So in this instance, if the family hadn't set up a special needs trust, but they did set up an ABLE account and they had $200,000 of life insurance that was supposed to flow into the ABLE account, that child would need to spend down the assets down to $100,000 before they could go back on to Social Security income. So those are just some of the provisions in regards to what you can do with the ABLE Act, but then also um, some of the confounds of what you can't do with the ABLE Act. Next one. Um, the other thing about the ABLE, I'm gonna have you skip this slide, Janine, and go to the next slide. The other thing about the ABLE account is that it is what we call a Medicaid payback trust. So you want to be careful about how much money you actually put in here because if the child does pass, the funds will first be paid back to Medicaid for anything that child received. And then after that, if there's anything left over, would go to another beneficiary. But it is a Medicaid payback trust. Um, so know that you don't want to overfund it but you don't want to underfund it. The reason why I personally think that they came up with the ABLE Act is to allow families who have adults who can work and want to earn more than 70 cents an hour to be able to earn dollars, put them into the ABLE account, and still not get kicked out of Social Security benefits. So I think it's more of an account that you can utilize um, over time, but at the same time is not the primary place for all of your assets to flow into, okay? Um, can you go? Let's see if okay. we have some, do a little time, because we're coming up on five or six minutes left. 
And I know okay. there were a couple of questions out there. So before we tie this up, could we um, address those questions? Sure, can. Absolutely. Um, hello, this is Colleen. I have a question about um, the funds, what you're actually able to spend the funds in the ABLE account for. Um, it had said in the slide that there was housing and medical expenses. Um, I just have a little confusion about that. Can you clarify what expenses are allowed through that? So if you have um, therapies, if you have doctor's visits, medical expenses, if they are paying you rent for living at home or if they're living in independent living, all of those things can be um, used from the ABLE account. Okay, so that includes the housing, so that includes rent and stuff Correct. like that. Yes, okay. so if you're receiving SSI and you're having the, the payment go into the ABLE account, you okay. want that, that ABLE account to pay you rent. Um, a, so you can show Social Security that they're paying rent, right? And B, um, so that you can use that provision from the ABLE account. Okay. Good okay. question. Do we have any other questions? The ABLE account uh, in Ohio, oh sorry, the ABLE account in Ohio is called the STABLE account, S-T-A-B-L-E account. And if you go to stableaccount.com, you can sign up there. It's all done online and you can pick from a cash account or three different, three or four different kinds of investments. Um, conservative, moderate, aggressive, moderate, conservative, and moderate, aggressive, I believe are your choices if you want those dollars to be invested. So this account can be set up without a financial advisor Correct. or an attorney. You can just go online to this yes, to yes. This URL and set it up. It's a state account, so it's only done online through the state. And as Helen, this is Janine, as Helen mentioned earlier when she did the introductions, we did have another webinar that is recorded that talks a little bit more about the different types of trusts, trusts and goes into detail on that as well. So I would recommend taking a look at that. It's hard to cover everything in an hour, isn't it, Katie and Bryce? It does. Right, right. So Bryce, let's turn it back over to you. I don't think we have any other questions from the audience at this time. If you want to wrap it up and then I'll, um, I'll do the final concluding slides. Sounds great. Um, as you can see here, again, these are the most, some of the more common questions and hopefully we helped answer some of these today for you and we know a lot of times more questions tend to pop up after you leave here today. So if you ever have other questions or concerns, feel free to reach out to us. Oh, and I believe there is a downloadable form um, that you, if you had specific questions that you could fill out and then we could reach out to you and have a conversation. And then here is Katie and I's contact information as well. Yes, that handout is in the control panel. There's a section called hand, handouts, and it discusses. It's a contact form that you can uh, um, indicate your questions and reach specifically out to Skylight Financial, uh, Katie and Bryce. Thank you. We want to really thank Skylight Financial Group, and they have a wonderful website too that you uh, might want to to visit especially the special needs planning information. Thank you so much for sharing your time. And all the participants on this webinar, we you will receive a brief evaluation that will display at the end of the webinar. And re remember that there will be a recording of this so you can listen to it again and previous webinars. And those are available at redtreehouse.org webinars. We also have another session coming up. Um, those of you who might have been on the April webinar, a lot of questions came up that we didn't have all the time to answer. So Blaine Brockman is going to do an Ask Me Anything 
question and answer session on Tuesday, June 26th from 12 to 1, and you can register for that on, on that webinar page of Red Tree House as well. If you have other questions, and please feel free to reach out to, to me if it's specifically about webinars and our topics. There is a question in that evaluation um, that you will complete that asks for your thoughts on other webinars and information that we should make available to folks through Red Tree House. Okay. I want to thank everyone for being here today. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.